Welcome to Season 10 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. I want to thank all of you for watching. Our first 100 episodes garnered over 20,000 organic views. I couldn't do it without you. Please share, please subscribe, and enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I am joined by a powerhouse. I mean, a formidable woman. I was reviewing her LinkedIn um, profile, and I want you to really take in all the different hats she wears, okay? So she is, first and foremost, an AI ethics and cyber diplomacy enthusiast. She's a data ethics and privacy expert. She's also a gender equality activist. She's the founder of JND Charitable Trust, a corporate director, a legal engineer, and an advocate on the Supreme Court of India, Welcome to the show, Divya Dvibedi. So lovely to meet you. Thank you for the invitation. I am so excited about our conversation, which I know is going to be really quite far reaching. I don't think we're going to actually, I wonder if we're going to find uh, a general theme across all of these different dimensions of your life. But I was so intrigued by your bio that I would wonder, I would like to start by just getting to know the twists and turns of your professional career, a little bit about you. You can trace it back to, you know, your formative years as a kid and why you do the work that you do. Wow. That'll take more than an hour, but I'll try to keep it in under 10 minutes or rather five. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. So I, uh, when I was born, like for my mother, I was a kind of prized position. And for my family, I will, I'm the firstborn. So I got all the love, care, and all the dare. And I was allowed to ask questions since day one I could speak. Uh, being a girl in any country, anywhere, I would say it's not that appreciated that she keeps on asking questions and decides everything on her own. But I was allowed to. And that was, for me, that was lucky. I won't say everyone gets that luck, but I really wish that that happened sooner than later in the world itself, especially in India. So for many people, uh, uh, they were envious of my luck. And I used to get whatever I wanted under the purview of my parents, under their grasp, they have provided me. And they gave me a chance to choose whatever field I wanted to study, however I wanted to study. So when I reached class, I would say senior secondary, then I realized that I'm good at maths and I really want to enter into a field which involves mathematical calculations and computers and other things. So that allowed me to do engineering and my parents were like, okay, fine, because my dad was an engineer and my mom was a professor. So they were like, okay, fine. If you want to do it, do it. Wherever you want to do it, do it. So I went almost a thousand kilometers away from my home. Uh, in uh, early 2000, it was kind of a shocker for everyone that a girl is being sent out that far from home. How will you um, uh, take care of her if something goes wrong, if she falls prey to some wrongdoing, something. But then they were like, no, we have full faith in our daughter. And we are allowed to, I was allowed to go and they allowed me and I love them for that. So what happened when I reached there, I saw as little as five or six girls around me in the whole college and it was filled with boys. Uh, since it was a mathematics course. So for uh, everyone, it was uh, weird that girls are doing it. But anyways, I carried on and did. There on, I started teaching girls, especially girls, why I'm saying is because I really wanted them to see what kind of opportunities they can get if they learn in a proper manner and they choose and they have a choice to actually find out for themselves as in where they can reach how far reaching their career can be. Even if they are homemakers, they should be the best homemakers in the world, I would say. So that started my uh, uh, charitable work that started helping me get a lot of internships in NGOs. And I started doing a lot of charity work through that. And that prompted me to realize that maths is not my final calling. I think I need to 
earn in order to return people uh, with that earning. So I did my MBA and uh, then thereafter I started the NGO right after my marriage and I was lucky to have equally like-minded and same wavelength husband who is more of my friend rather than I would say husband. He is my partner in, I would say, everything. He just supports me, I would say, blindly. He says, whatever you will do cannot go wrong and cannot be wrong. So I started the NGO in his paternal village. There, uh, there were no schools in the vicinity in around 20 kilometer radius. So we started small stitching schools, then smaller schools for kids. Uh, targeting those people who actually cannot pay for their fees, who cannot go to school via bus or any other convents. So we tried to find ways in order to provide their fees directly to the school so that there is no misconception of losing money or maybe any fraud. So that uh, helped us do a lot of things. And through that, I have done a lot of work in the villages during even COVID times. And it's almost a decade now that we have been working in the same field. My focus was to do awareness about health, specifically because if you are healthy, then you can understand your environment better. Once health awareness is there, then I wanted to make them aware about their legal rights. Because what I see, Anywhere, wherever I talk about law, most of the people are scared of two professions. One is lawyer and the one is the police department. And they are scared because they do not know their rights. And I love this part about Western countries that kids are being taught about their rights since day one. At least they know their rights. <coughs> Sorry. How to implement or not implement is a later thing. At least you know your rights. You raise your voice. You have that option. So I try to do that through uh, many lawyers. They, I am thankful to them as well. They, they gave me their full support in village, rural areas, in urban areas as well. I won't say that all the urban people, they know everything. They don't. <laughs> it's mostly they fight in India. Uh, so that, that gave me a lot of pool of supporters. It's more than 20K supporters we have now and... Uh, we enjoy that privilege in almost 20, 22 villages now. And mostly I have worked for old age people, women and children. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but by then I was not a lawyer. And that uh, particular uh, annoyance that lawyers do not provide everything for free uh, prompted me to do law. So I went ahead and did law after my marriage, which was another a shocker for most of the society around me, uh, especially uh, family as well, that how will your marriage survive? You're going for uh, study for three years, going away, and how will this work? How will he do everything? I said, I'm anyways not doing anything for him. It's him who cooks for me, so it's better for him. He'll have to cook for one person. But um, for people to accept this, it was hard, you know, because for them, it's like provider at home has to be a female, which I feel very bad about. And usually I have fights about this. I have never been that cook kind of person who will cook in the kitchen for sake of providing her husband. No, I cannot. The moment someone tells me that you have to do it, I'll, I'll, I'll retaliate. I never go ahead and say that, okay, fine, I'll do it. And I've seen docile women who actually are doing a lot of work in the house without any uh, payment, without any appreciation, anything. And I really feel very bad about them. And I can't even tell them to quit it because they really have no other place to go. And I see it every now and then around me. So that's how I did my law somehow with all the support from my husband, my family. I came back and got lucky that my seniors found my profile good enough to assist them. That's where my journey for AI also started because of my engineering background. It was easier for me to understand as in how technology works. So I picked up that particular issue <coughs> of ethics and morality, I would say. I do talk about morality more and spirituality more rather than only ethics because somehow ethics are rules which are sometimes binding, sometimes non-binding. But it uh, gives you a sense of safety around society. 
But when you talk about morality, according to me, I feel that it comes somewhere from within you, from your heart, from your brain, that this is something which is moral to do and not moral to do. So I believe that there is a very fine line in, uh, between ethics and morality. So I prefer to talk more about morality. And that's my journey till now. And I love talking about all these things all the time. So I keep speaking. Well, we'll continue to talk about all these things. So I'm going to circle back to this issue of morality first. But um, so there's two things that I really want to address um, now that you've shared this super interesting, uh, circuitous pathway through math and engineering and then law and working as a social entrepreneur. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, but you reached out to me and uh, I found that curious because of the sort of interesting bio that you have that you are attracted to empathy. And so I wanted to also at the onset say, what is it about the topic of empathy that draws you and that you think animates all the work that you do? I would say everything. Empathy has everything to do with everything in the world. Because if you do not have empathy, if you do not have a position of that particular aspect of life, being empathetic, you cannot do anything in the world, at least not for living beings, not for non-living beings, nobody. You you just cannot. And that is the reason I think uh, I'm more drawn towards AI ethics rather than just AI. Because empathy is something which comes from you, which helps you understand people better. I have seen this around me that the moment a person is a little bit rude, I would say, other person starts moving away from them and they just cannot share their problem, their issues. There are so many issues. Every person has a different life. They have seen the life in a very different manner. So one has to have, like you say, purposeful empathy. It should be there. And I feel that runs the world. And sooner we understand it, better we will live in life. You found yourself... Um, as a professional wanting to help society. And, you know, uh, the JND Charitable Trust looks at a whole host of topics, right? When you go on your website, you're looking at agriculture and labor and employment, health and family welfare, gender equality. And I'm I'm curious to unpack maybe for a second, I come back to this model, hi Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We all know it. And once our basic needs are met, then we come, come up to the top of this pyramid and, and we get to this idea of self-actualization, like fulfillment of, of our individual purpose. And it wasn't until about two years ago that I came across Maslow's later work that was not published, that is starting to surface, where he himself, just before he died, said, my model is wrong. The pinnacle of self of fulfillment of what we're capable of being as humans is not about how much we can self-actualize, but how much we can then give to the world and be of service to the world, what he called self-transcendence. And I find that whenever I have conversations now with people who have, I feel, transcended self-actualization and are now living in a space of self-transcendence, which it sounds like you're doing by all the work that you do, um, I wonder if you could speak to what that means for you and how that's changed your life. Because I think if more people understood the benefit we accrue in this kind of, you know, reciprocal relationship of being of service and how it feels good, more of us would do it. Uh, so, okay, fine. Let's talk from the point of hierarchy. Uh, like you said, the need when it is fulfilled, we try and find self-actualization. Uh, in India, especially in our culture, that is Sanatan Dharma, uh, we from very start, from childhood, from every epic we have, every book we have, like Gita, like Ramayana, like Purans, Vedas, everything, everywhere it's written that if you share your things, you'll have more happiness to yourself rather than just keeping it to yourself. So before Maslow, it was actually being said that if you share that means you are caring that means you have a wider world view rather than just the self-actualization view so here we never talk about 
just our self satisfaction our satisfaction comes from providing to others either by imparting education or imparting food medication whatever you do so since childhood since uh, my grandfather my mom both were sanskrit scholars so they taught me a lot of <laughs> sanskrit stuff where i could read write and understand exactly what was there in vedas i have read only two yet uh two more to go but what i have understood is it was inculcated in me uh, by the doings of my parents by the doings of my mother in law i would say my in laws family as well they believe in giving more rather than keeping for themselves even when it is some time like covid if you're enjoying this conversation i bet you'll love reading my book purposeful empathy tapping our hidden superpower for personal organizational and social change we are living in the era of a massive empathy deficit but humans are wired to care and we can become more empathic with practice and the more you do the better you'll feel please visit your favorite online retailer and order your copy today so you mentioned um ethics in ai and in technology and i'm curious because you also said ethics can be one framework but you are looking more at the moral morality the moral nature and the spiritual even the word you used um nature of of technology so what do you mean by all of that what work is that what does that look like uh, how are you trying to shape technology with that as frames Wow. Okay. So uh, we are a very small bunch of people who talk about spiritual AI most of the times, and uh, people actually confuse it with religion. But we have, I have never understood spirituality in terms of religion. For me, spirituality is about gaining peace, uh, gaining that particular inner peace. You have seen Kung Fu Panda, right? He talks about inner peace, and that's something which you get from spirituality. being spiritual is being connected to that spiritual being that super being which gives you the peace of mind where you keep yourself calm while you are working for people even if they do not accept what you say what you do for them but you find peace in doing that i do not say that let's make technology spiritual let's make it in such a way that it becomes spiritual being spiritual and becoming spiritual are two different things like empathy like sympathy like your peaceful mind or being pur- purposeful everything has two concepts for me i have understood it as being or becoming trying to become something like ai is a human generated concept artificial intelligence is something which we are trying to make machines become more intelligent but it is our child we are feeding it data we are feeding it information we are making it either general uh, uh, in 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 general concepts or in in terms of neural networks we are trying to make it more human like so in a sense we can think of it as our baby whom we are feeding whatever we feel should be best for it so when it comes to understanding ethical ai for me for my talks or maybe gender neutral ai or maybe non discriminatory ai non biased ai everything depends on data the kind of knowledge we are providing ai so if humans as humans we are not so non discriminatory i won't say that we do not discriminate we do as humans we have a very bad habit of judging everything being a little discriminatory even if we are not being on the face of it we definitely have some set of mind so how do we expect all of a sudden for technology or artificial intelligence to become absolutely neutral that's not possible so even trying to make it from the day one still we will not achieve that particular neutrality or equality unless we make our data absolutely equal we do not talk about equality in the same terms all over the world so till the time it happens we ha- will have to keep on talking about ethics 
it will only be talks till we make our data totally ethical, totally moral. Like you asked me, why I talk about morality? Because morality is there. We are by birth born with the morality inside our hearts. Somehow when you are going to do something wrong, your mind and your heart definitely pings you. Dude, you are going to do something wrong. Don't do this. This is wrong. That's something which has nothing to do with ethics. It's just your morality which pings you all the time. Don't do this. But we stop ourselves not because of our mind or brain telling us. We do it just because of the rules and regulations which we have to follow because of the laws imposed. So we try and be ethical and not moral, which, which I feel is wrong in most of the terms. So I really want to make technologies more moral rather than ethical. Because the moment you are moral and morality is reached, ethical concepts will be clear and we will definitely be ethical. Uh, <laughs> that's what I, I understand. I'm imagining sort of um, a critical question as a follow-up, which is, well, morality according to whom. But I think what I'm discerning is there's a universal morality around equality and peace and justice, those kinds of high values that we can all aspire to. Is that what I'm sensing? Absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. And you're starting to have conversations with engineers and 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 companies and startups, and that's starting to happen in your mind. Yeah, that's wonderful. It is happening, and it, it keeps on happening because for engineers, as my engineer mind says, it is uh, for them. It's not easy to accept that. How can you make technology ethical? How is that even possible? Technology is technology. It's non-biased. There is always neutrality. No, it is not. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely biased. Mm -hmm. And when you show it to them with the cases, that makes them realize. But still, since they are not that philosophical or I would say more inclined towards society work, uh, I think we have to make them more sensitized. Yeah. Sensitization process is necessary right now. Yeah, absolutely. Not to mention that most of the technology is for profit, right? So that paradigm shapes it also, uh, the values of, of the for profit um paradigm. So the last question I will ask you, Divya, and thank you for all the time we've spent together. I close my interviews with all my guests by asking if they can think of a time when they were on the receiving end of purposeful empathy, when they felt that someone extended empathy to them and what that meant for you. There was one time at which I can share that I was at the receiving end when I started my law course. I felt all alone and there was this person who was somehow always there uh, and she uh, never believed in being friends with anyone but I don't know what she liked in me. She was always there and I felt like there is something which is poking her to come to me somehow and uh, there have been uh, many, many issues which arise in life. Her life had her own difficulties but she understood mine. And when you are receiving something like this, you really feel, at least I feel, that I should be able to someday give it back to someone in a need of that. And why I'm saying in need is, it's not that your empathy is always needed, but when it is needed, I think that is the time when you should never fall back. You, you should be able to be there. And I, I feel that, I really wish that I be there for my people who need me at that time and I be able to give them that particular purposeful empathy at that time. I really want to add one more thing that you said technology is for profit. Profit is something which gives us economy and it's not only for profit. Technology has given us many things. One of them is the beauty that we are sharing right now. You are in another part of the world. I'm in another part of the world. We are in at least 12 hours difference and we are enjoying this technology. Mm -hmm. So I think this gives us empathy and I'll, I'll get some good feedback from you. I'll get good purposeful re results, answers from you. Maybe you'll be able to tell me why I needed that empathy at that time. So I think technology is something which gives us beautiful life as well.
like we have electricity like we have laptops like we have so many things <laughs> yeah and i'll now wrap it up done <laughs> Divya, it's been wonderful to spend this time with you 12 hours apart on the other side of the planet through this laptop and technology. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your passion for the work that you do. And I really appreciate it. Lovely talking to you. Thank you. Namaste. We wish you all a wonderful week. We'll see you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you for watching another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Remember, this show is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. If you want to get involved, share this video, subscribe to this channel. See you next week. Thank you so much.